How is this already happening? Jose Alvarado has sprained his ankle in an off-season workout. How much time might he miss and who needs to step up? Plus, let's take a deep dive and I'll explain why I'm not worried about the Pelicans rim protection. It's Monday's episode of Locked On Pelicans. Let's go. You are Locked On Pelicans, your daily New Orleans Pelicans podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to another edition of Locked On Pelicans, the daily podcast covering your favorite team, the New Orleans Pelicans and NBA, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day, available wherever you get your podcasts and available on YouTube. I'm your host, Pelicans Insider, credential member of the media, Jake Madison, at Nola Jake on Twitter, here with y'all on this Monday, and guess what? We are back to five days a week here on Locked On Pelicans. We're about two weeks or so away from media day. That means training camp. That means preseason. And before you know it, regular season basketball is upon us. We're going to be back to five days a week, getting you set up for everything you need to know about this Pelicans team, the number one Pelicans podcast out there. So please make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube. And if you want to support the channel, comment down below on YouTube. It's the number one thing you can do other than being an everydayer. Listen Monday through Friday. Never miss a show. Know what's going on around this team. And if you are an everydayer, let me know in the comments down below. We're going to have a lot of fun in there this season. And coming up after the first segment, I'll talk about a new way for y'all to interact with me. That's not Twitter X, which has just become a nightmare to you. So I'm excited to start rolling this out to y'all as we get ready for the start of the regular season. And would it be a Pelican season if there wasn't an injury. Oh, by the way, today's episode of Locked On Pelicans is brought to you by FanDuel, official sports book of Locked On. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers can bet $5 and get 200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. So would it be a Pelican season if there weren't injuries? Of course not, because whatever. <sighs> I can't even like try and make the jokes, right? I'm just frustrated after the Trey Murphy injury news, needing to have surgery on his meniscus. We get another kind of dose of this, which is just the most Pelicans thing ever. Jose Alvarado, according to Sham Sharania of The Athletic, has sprained his ankle in an off-season workout and now is maybe not going to be ready for training camp or the start of training camp. Well, training camp starts in two weeks. I believe media day, I don't know if it's been announced for sure or not, is going to be something like two weeks from today. It's going to be Monday, October 2nd. They go into training camp for that next week or so, and then you go right into preseason. They have a preseason game on the 10th, I believe, of October. So if he's out for three weeks, he misses that. This is going to impact him in some way. I don't know if this is the type of ankle sprain. We don't have more details than that just yet. That... Keeps you out for like six weeks. One of those high ankle sprains that can be brutal if you're an NBA player. If you're a guard in particular who's kind of changing direction, relying on some of that. And Jose Alvarado with some of the shiftiness that he has definitely does. But this is one of those things that just impacts the start of the season for New Orleans. And that's not good because as I've said throughout this whole offseason and talking about Zion Williamson, you know, This is a make or break year for the team. Like if it goes sideways here, you can't keep running it back and doing the same thing. And that means like significant, significant changes need to happen and need to come to all of this. So even if he'll be ready for the start of the regular season, and you have to imagine that he would be, and you know, at that point in theory, right? Always that would be fully ready to go. Maybe not on a minutes restriction or anything like that. This still impacts your preparation. Would he be as sharp as he would be if he was in training camp and other things? And when your schedule is actually like somewhat difficult at times, even though they have a number of home games, the Pelicans schedule is kind of right down the middle in terms of hard, easy, like a very fair, balanced schedule that they have. It's still not great. They need to get off to a fast start, particularly because the end of the uh, schedule, the final 10 games or so, 15 games or so, are actually pretty tough and a lot of tough road games there too. So you need to make and have a cushion, build a cushion, 
to be able to kind of deal with what might come at the end of the year so that it doesn't impact you in a negative way too much. The other thing that you need to get off to a fast start for is, look, they're going to have other injuries. Do you expect Zion to play 82 games, Brandon Ingram to play 82 games? I don't, unfortunately. They might play 65 or more, but there's going to be a stretch where you're without one or both of those guys. So having won more games early on and not needing a must-win game without Brandon Ingram, without Zion Williamson, is exactly the position this team needs to put themselves in. So a fast start is imperative. So while I think Jose Alvarado can be ready for the start of the regular season, I'd like him like fully, fully ready to go with no sort of injury or anything you know, being as good as he can be. And this will likely impact him in some way. It's just not ideal, though luckily not as significant as the Trey Murphy injury news. Now, all of that said, this, you know, depending on it, could either provide an opportunity for certain players or, or, you know, test the Pelicans' depth a little bit. If for whatever reason he's not ready for the start of the regular season, you know, you're going to need to give minutes and you probably are really going to need to give these minutes to Jordan Hawkins. Dyson Daniels might need to take a larger role since Jose Alvarado is the closest thing they have to a pure point guard, that kind of creator, connector kind of guy. Dyson Daniels might be number two and you have to figure Jose was maybe going to be above him at least to start in the rotation. You also lose out on, and we'll get into this actually in the next two segments, look at that segue, um, some of the defense that he provides and just that feistiness and spirit. And so you kind of need players to step up to all of this. You know, this does give an opportunity to maybe a guy like Kyra Lewis Jr. This is their fourth year player out of Alabama. You know, he was suffered an injury two years ago, finally came back, you know, in the middle of last season, a little bit healthy, you know, after coming back from that in December, January, had some moments and just hasn't, you know, gotten the opportunity since then. The Pelicans have been trying to push for the playoffs so they couldn't, you know, necessarily play the guy who's kind of a little bit greener coming back from injuries because you had to rely on the guys that have kind of been there. Does this give an opportunity to Jose Alvarado, or not, sorry, Jose Alvarado, Kyra Lewis Jr.? And I think the answer is yes, it definitely could. So this is an opportunity for him in preseason, if Jose Alvarado doesn't play, to go and make a statement and show that he should be part of this rotation, that he should be getting significant minutes. But it's also important for him for his future. He's going to be a restricted free agent after this season. Are the Pelicans going to keep him? Does he have a spot in the league somewhere? And if he wants to earn more money, they all do. There's millions of dollars at stake here. Does he get the opportunity to, you know, kind of, build on that. And so if you're him, while you don't want injuries on anybody, right, this this is a great opportunity for Kyra to live up to the potential and really kind of create a spot for himself in the NBA. I don't think he'll be out of the league or anything if he's not good this year, but it's certainly going to impact the trajectory of his career. He showed he still has the speed, that he can get downhill a little bit, and he shot the three ball well, albeit on very limited attempts last season. And if he can replicate some of that in preseason, Given the injuries, given Jose might not be fully ready to go, he might have a chance to get some minutes that he wasn't otherwise going to be getting. That's really important for him, and he needs to try and seize this opportunity, and he's the guy that could benefit the most from this unfortunate and hopefully not very long situation. It is not fun the first day back going to five days a week to be talking about injuries, but that's what we got to do. So coming up next... Let's pivot. I wanted to talk about rim protection, defense. We've looked at last week, should they sign a guy like Nerlens Noel, someone else? And I said, no, I don't think they need rim protection. I'm going to give you the numbers behind it, explain why, but explain how it could go uh, not great, very not quickly, but I'll explain coming up here next in today's episode of Locked on Pelicans. Before we get to that, though, today's episode of Locked On Pelicans is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. Snap into action this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. And right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. Win or lose, you're getting $200 in bonus bets. That's free 
money right there. Win or lose. If you've th been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is super easy to use. It's laid out incredibly well. You can see the spreads, the player props, the over-unders, and more all right there on your phone. It's just the easiest thing, just a wide range of betting options. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. And thank you for making Locked On Pelicans your first listen today and every day. We are here, the number one Pelicans podcast, Monday through Friday now. Coming back to y'all, talking everything New Orleans Pelicans. We are going to get you set for media day. I will be there. I'm looking forward to the season, the coverage. And I've also got a new way for you to interact with me and some new coverage. We are running a Locked On Pelicans insider thing group through this setup called subtext which i love you can text me now instead of tweeting at me which i may or may not be looking at dming me on twitter which i may or may not be looking at send me a text i will have the link in the description of the show whether you're on youtube or getting it through wherever you get your podcast i'm going to have the subtext link there for you to join it comes with a 14 day trial free trial it's 4.99 a month after that Give me the free trial. If you like it, keep it. If don't, no worries. The show is still going to be the same here, but I'm going to give you inside info. There's going to be exclusive content for y'all, Q&As, some other videos that you won't be able to get elsewhere too. Just another way to interact on a much more personal level with y'all. And just, hey, if something's on my mind, instead of sending it as a tweet, I'm probably going to send it to the subtext here so you'll get it right to your phone as a text message. So you'll see that in the uh, description of the video or podcast wherever you get your podcast. So if you want to support the channel, jump on that. And of course, become an everydayer and listen Monday through Friday. And for your second listen, it is Monday. The Saints play the Carolina Panthers Monday night football. Host Ross Jackson of the Locked On Saints podcast, breaking down everything black and gold. Make them your second listen today. Let's get a little nerdy here. Let's get into some of the stats that I want to talk about. I've Long looked at the Pelicans defense and I, you know, when I ask y'all and we'll ask this probably in the subtext and other places too, you know, what's the number one thing you want to see them address? What do they need to add? Rim protection is something that I hear a lot of and I very much, very much disagree with that actually. The defense, let me remind you, was sixth best last year. It was a good defense. They ranked low in blocks per game. Absolutely. They had just 4.1 blocks per game, which was 24th out of 30 in the NBA last season. Based on looking at that, right, you're like, oh, they need more blocks. They need more rim protection. They weren't getting nearly as many. But that's not exactly true. And so I use a website called cleaningtheglass.com, which is a very useful NBA stats tool that you actually have to pay and subscribe to. And I want to look at one of the things, a couple of the stats they have. They You can sort data, and you know, it's big in the NBA, defense shooting and by frequency. So percentage of opponent shots that are at the rim, which they define as shots within four feet of the basket. So essentially the restricted area. The Pelicans ranked ninth best last season. Just 32% of opponents shot attempts were within four feet. That was ninth best in the league last season. The year before that, they were also right around that number. They were 10th best. Shots closer to the rim tend to have a higher field goal percentage. You convert them at a higher rate, making them a more efficient shot. You know, shots at the rim, and I can actually tell you this. Let me pull up the accuracy number here. Went in two-thirds of the time. 66.6% .6 was the league average. Shots from, say, mid-range were 43.6%. You can kind of do the math and see one of them's better than the other. So if you want to manufacture efficient, high-quality looks, get closer to the basket and score that way. This is what Zion Williamson does, right? This is why I don't want Zion to add or really change his game too much because I want him taking the better shot than the worst shot, or at least one that's comparably worse, even if it's still good, because that's what he does. So while shots at the rim go in at a higher rate, okay, if you don't want that, limit shot attempts at the rim. The Pelicans do a very good job of that. They've done that now for two seasons under Willie Green. If you're limiting shot attempts, and thus there are fewer of them, you have fewer opportunities to get blocks. So when you look at some of these statistics, particularly the block numbers and other things that are like per game, it's not actually representative of what's going on. They just have fewer chances to block shots at the rim, which is where you block the majority of shots, right? You don't block three pointers very often, which is why it's incredible when Herb Jones does it. So this is kind of 
a battle of frequency versus conversion percentage. I actually didn't think what it threw what I was going to say right there for you. Because while they allow a few amount of shots at the rim, the Pelicans were league worst last year in terms of field goal percentage at the rim. I said the average was 66.6. Two out of three ain't bad. Meatloaf, awesome, awesome singer here. The Pelicans allowed 71.6% at the rim. So higher than league average and actually 30th out of 30 in the league. That's not great. So this comes down to, and this is like what I have written in my, my short show notes here, right? If you're bad at something and you can say the Pelicans are bad when it comes to opponent field goal percentage at the rim, limit how often it happens to you. If you know that's a weakness, make sure that weakness doesn't get exposed as often. And that's what the Pelicans are doing. So this is a frequency versus you know, it's like a volume thing versus a, a percentage thing. You kind of look at that sometimes when it comes to three-point shooting with players and teams. Okay, if you know you're bad at something, make sure teams can't do it too often. And the Pelicans do a very good job of that. And they rode that to the sixth best defense last season. One of the reasons they're so effective at limiting shot attempts at the rim is the way they do defend. And this is why we are potentially looking for a center upgrade. They switch. They're... The simplest way to put it is this. What's the like main action in NBA offenses outside of like an isolation play where the dude just has the ball in his hand and he's free to do whatever and go and score? It's a pick and roll action, right? Play with the ball dribbling. Someone comes and sets a screen, sets a pick. You kind of go around that. And then what happens? And there's multiple ways to defend the pick and roll. And I, if you're interested in this, I can even do a show breaking down like the normal ways that you see pick and roll defense in the league. You know, there's things like hedging. There's things like going above the screen, below the screen. There's drop coverage where a guy kind of backs up a little bit to take away the roll to the hoop. One of the ones that teams run and that the Pelicans do is you switch. So you have your, your, your guard on your guard, your big man on your big man. And instead of that guard trying to fight through the screen or doing something else, it goes, hey, switch. The players communicate. The guard now guards the big man, defends the big man. I should say it that way. And then the big man defends the guard. And they switch. And basically, it doesn't, get, it doesn't always work. There's reasons for that and why. But one of the things that it can do is just not give the defense space. So they can't start driving to the basket. And that's how they keep teams from getting into the paint, being able to score at the rim. They're just not letting them do it with the defensive scheme. And as long as that defensive scheme is sound, and we'll get into that more in the next segment here, they're going to be fine defensively, even if they lack some of the rim protection based on some of the numbers that we've seen. There are other issues they need to address defensively too, rebounding being one of them, and I'd look for that over blocking shots. Ending possessions versus blocking shots, and block shots aren't always a great representation of this. You look at a guy like Hassan Whiteside, who was a great shot blocker when he, is he still in the league? I don't even know. And you know, one of the things that he would always do is he blocks shots out of bounds where your opponent retains possession. Anthony Davis, on the other hand, was always great at blocking shots and like having that ball either like just corralling it with those long arms or blocking a shot like to a teammate for a fast break. Those are valuable. The other shots are or the other blocks are a little bit of like empty stats and things. So because they do such a good job of limiting it, and this has been sound for two years now, so it's not like last year was a fluke, I think they're going to be okay defensively. This also goes to something that I hear people say with this, and again, I disagree with this, is, well, what if teams start getting at the rim and scoring, and they're going to give up a ton of you know, points, and that's going to look terrible. Yeah, you're right, but they don't let that happen, and for two years, they haven't. And looking at that now, what, twice is a, twice a coincidence, three times is a trend? In the NBA, if you're doing it for two seasons, it's a trend, and it's what this team does, and that's why I don't think you need like just a sh- pure shot blocker out there that doesn't do really anything else. So coming up next, let's talk more about the defense. What if the defense struggles? What do you need to start looking at? What do you need to start doing? That's what I want to get into coming up here next in today's episode of Locked on Pelicans. 
And thank you for making Locked On Pelicans your first listen today and every day. We are here a Monday through Friday for y'all, breaking down everything you want to know, the number one Pelicans podcast. We are back to five days a week. We are still going to do the live shows Thursday at 7 p.m. Central. Those have been fun. Great way to interact with y'all. Consider joining the subtext. I'll have the link in the video description below and on where, wherever you get your podcast. Another way to interact with y'all. When I get a thought, it's going to go right there instead of on Twitter, which is just breaking by the day. I love this way of being able to interact with y'all. Ross Jackson of Locked On Saints does it too. And he puts, I'm just going to follow that dude's blueprint because he's the best and kind of do what he does because it's great. Keeps me up to date on the Saints. I get it as a text injury updates, just thoughts that he has, other exclusive content too. If you have a question, you can just message it to me that way. It's a whole lot easier. I'm really looking forward to rolling this out to y'all. So consider joining 14 day free trial with it as well. And of course, Ross Jackson, Locked On Saints, your second listen today. It's Monday Night Football. Black and Gold going to win? Can they go 2-0 and oh and keep up with like others in the division? That's um, going to be kind of interesting with everything, and I hope so. All right, so let's keep talking about the defense here a little bit. We just kind of went over that I'm not really worried about the rim protection because the defense does a good job. And again, if you're interested in like some some shows because we still have time about this just kind of breaking down defenses more x's and o's stuff in the nba and how it works at that level i'm happy to do some of those that actually might be really kind of fun you know we can also do like an advanced stats primer and things like that like what do i look for and those kind of things these are good ideas we're coming up with here on the fly thanks for your help in this so I think they'll be okay because their defense does limit shots at the rim even if those numbers aren't great that they give up a you know higher than average uh conversion rate field goal percentage at the rim and that's also been the case for two years but the six best defense last year does say something now if they don't keep teams out of the paint for whatever reason and this does start to fall apart yeah that kind of changes things and they need to make a bit of an adjustment i think but right now with the jose alvarado injury news with the the injury news to trey murphy who's actually going to be out for part of the regular season you know if you're looking at adding someone because they do have an open roster spot is it a guard is it a wing or is it a big man i'm not looking at a big man at all even with a guy like nerland's noel and a couple others out there too it's why i also had no interest in javel mcgee coming to new orleans i think they're kind of set at that position with Valanciunas, with Zion Williamson, with Larry Nance Jr., with Cody Zeller, and, you know, who else, right? And I think that will at least work for now, and they've done a good enough job with rim protection, with defense in that general area that it should be okay. They just need to get better at defensive rebounding versus blocking shots. I think Zeller might be a guy they close with at times over Valanciunas, over Nance, because he can defend on the perimeter. He can switch which Valanciunas can't do really well or isn't effective at doing. Larry Nance Jr. can. Zeller can a little bit. And he also has enough height, whereas Larry Nance Jr. is a little undersized, to give you some of that rebounding that they need. Because if you go back to that same Minnesota game, final game of the regular season or second to last, whatever it was, and they gave up too many offensive boards and lost that game, that was a real big problem. Over, like, blocking shots and rim protection. Just rebound and get the ball. Simple as that and when you look at the injury to Jose you know I don't know if this team necessarily wants to rely on Kyra Lewis Jr. if they want to rely on Jordan Hawkins just yet and Hawkins is more of a shooter and less of a ball handler so do they want to bring someone in and I think that's as you look at this open roster spot which I doubt they'll do anything with unless they were to really know they have a move lined up to get under the luxury tax, something I'm sure they don't want to pay this year. Well, might, might if they need to, but ideally don't. And look, it's of the, all the years, is this year to do it? No, next year is probably the year to do it. So if you know we have to take into account that the team will, say, pay it once, I'd rather it be next year than this year. They should pay it all the time, though. So... We'll see what they do, but I wouldn't be shocked if they do nothing and just, again, stick with this roster, try and roll with Kyra Lewis Jr. there, who's kind of the next man up when it comes to this, whereas Jordan Hawkins may be more of a wing kind of player, less of a ball handler, but he moves well off ball, so does Trey. Kyra can handle a lot of the ball handling duties, hopefully, and still give you a dimension that you don't have elsewhere, which is that kind of guard attacking downhill. He has very good speed. At Alabama, he was very capable of using that burst and that athleticism to get to the rim and score. Hasn't exactly translated to the NBA, but we've also seen that his 
speed is still there even after the knee surgery and the recovery that he went through. So I think they'll be okay. Defensively, if they struggle to start the year, which I don't anticipate from this team, they need to look at making a more dramatic move for center and then shoring up some of that. I think they'll be able to keep players out of the paint. They've been able to do it for two years now. But say it goes wrong, and there's no reason to think it will, that's when you need to really look at a bigger roster shakeup sooner rather than later, even though it likely wouldn't be until the trade deadline, which will be in February at some point again this year. I don't have the specific dates when it comes to all of that. But that's likely when you need to really start addressing rim protection. I don't think they're there yet. I think you need to look at rebounding, team rebounding, gang rebounding first before you stress too much about rim protection. And I think that that is what would end up fixing the majority of any potential, right? We're barring a problem from the future here. That's what would potentially fix any future defensive issues that they may have. But we don't need to borrow problems from the future. We're living in the present here, and we're going to talk about this team as they're constructed. We'll start going position by position. We'll start kind of comparing them to some of the other teams in the division as well. And, of course, if you have an idea for a show, a question you have, either send it to me on the subtext, which link is in the description, and I'll put it on Twitter too, or let me know in the comments down below on YouTube. Become an everydayer and support the channel that way. Keep this free and five days a week for y'all, the number one Pelicans podcast out here And if you're an everydayer, let me know in the comments down below. I appreciate y'all making Locked On Pelicans part of your daily routine. I'm excited to be back to five days a week with y'all talking hoops, talking Pels, talking NBA. It's going to be a lot of fun. Make or break, big year. Numbers say the Pelicans should be good. We'll get into that all as well. we got tons of stuff coming. And don't forget, live show Thursday at 7 p.m. Central. So that's going to do it for this episode of Locked On Pelicans, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Jake Madison, at Nola Jake on Twitter. And I'll be back with y'all tomorrow, not on Wednesday. That's exciting. See y'all then.